Good morning. Oh man, everyone's like more awake than me. <laughs> so yeah, Chris and I are filmmakers, and uh, today um, we're gonna talk about I think the most uh, extreme and difficult thing we've ever done, which is to make this film uh, prospect. So we wanted to start off uh, by by showing you uh, the the short, the sixty second trailer uh, for the film. screen. Oh, there it is. Sorry. 42 requesting release. I'm here to harvest the queen's lair. Someone is approaching. Well, this is something I have never seen in all my time in the green. A little girl. We're in the same trough, you and I. We'll find a way to get home if you find that buried treasure. Even the spy? Of course. Why should I trust you? I can offer protection. <laughs> the Queen's Lair. Where is it? You're gonna have to trust me. This is like such a positive group. I love it. <clears throat> All right. So uh, Chris and I, um, uh, we've lived in Seattle uh, for about a decade. Uh, the film industry here is, is really small. Uh, and we, we didn't go to film school, uh, nor did we actually work on other film sets. Uh, we studied English and creative writing in college and then right out of college started a small production company making videos and commercials for, um, you know, kind of like all the, the big folks in town, Microsoft, Amazon, the Seahawks, probably a lot of people, you know, work for those, those same companies. And uh, Prospect is original world science fiction, um, like kind of like Star Wars, like nothing you see on screen uh, is from this planet. Um, and these movies tend to be very expensive to make because everything you're looking at has to be made uh, from scratch. It all has to be original. Um, so obviously, Star Wars costs like hundreds of millions of dollars, but even in the indie film world, this type of film would generally be budgeted in Hollywood at about eight to 12 million dollars. Uh, and we made Prospect for under uh, four million dollars and I would argue we were able to do that because we didn't know the right way to do anything. <laughs> um, so I don't know if this is like an argument for ignorance or what, but, uh, uh, and, and it was, you know, it, it, a lot of times it was kind of miserable and painful and, and exhausting, um, but it, it worked. We got to make uh, our movie. So what we wanted to do today is show uh, a clip from the film and then get really specific and granular and talk about some of the creative challenges and weird things we did uh, to pull off just kind of one, one individual scene. Cool, so yeah, we're gonna play a clip um, just to give you a little bit of story context to interpret it. Uh, Prospect is a story about a father and daughter um, freelance team that travel out to the fringes of civilized space to um, drop into the, this toxic forest on, on this remote moon to harvest a rare and valuable substance called Orla. Um, the clip we're gonna show happens um, shortly after they crash land off course and in their process of getting back on track, they stumble onto an abandoned Orlac dig that was left over from a past rush. an old ore-like dig. 
Leftovers from the rush. On my last tour, the forest was full of these fringeling crank teams. Not many of them knew what they were doing. Got pretty scrappy. Do we have time for this? This is amateur work. <laughs> they might have left something behind. <sighs> Bring me the kit in the water. You want to cut it? Yeah. Okay. All right, right here in the middle. Good. Mix equal parts in the squeeze for the phaser. The blister is punctured, it releases carom acid. If it comes in contact with the gem, the whole pull is compromised. Hey! If the phaser touches meat, the whole dig blows. Be more careful. a solid pull back in the rush but our deposit is going to pull at least hecaton grade all right so okay so we're just going to jump right in um sorry mute so the first thing you might notice is there is this stuff floating in the air um kind of the one of the things that's kind of integral to the concept of the film is that this forest is toxic. Um, it's not friendly uh, to humans. It's why they have to wear these suits. <clears throat> and in filmmaking, this is what we call a global effect because this uh, visual effect has to cover every single exterior uh, of the film. And if you're a big Hollywood movie, you'd use what's uh, called a digital particle generator. It's essentially this fancy tool that makes artificial digital dust and just throws it on 
But for prospect, we wanted everything to feel real and physical and tactile. Uh, so this is dust uh, from my basement. Um, at the time, I was living in like an un I had a house with an unfinished basement, and um, because I was the cinematographer of the film and, and owned the camera, I just went by myself and spent three days in the dark stamping up dust and shooting it at like every conceivable angle. And we created this massive dust library that we then passed over to a visual artist who then had to match it to each individual shot. And uh, I think we scheduled about a month to do this whole process, and it took four months. Uh, it was incredibly, incredibly time consuming, and probably no one would have agreed to it had we known what uh, it really was going to take. Uh, but it looks cool. <laughs> so, the other thing you'll notice right away is, particularly for this audience, um, is that we are in the Ho Rainforest. Yeah, um, which we're probably not going to convince you that your backyard is an alien world, but it seems to be working elsewhere. Um, but uh, a lot of this film was shot out on this very, very remote location, and that's, again, something that generally requires uh, a lot of money to do. <clears throat> but we kind of took this tack that, no, like, we're, we, we have this, uh, oh, and then, and then you're also usually limited by choosing locations to where you can take, like, several semi-trucks worth of amenities and gear. And we took the tact of, like, no, we can, we have the Seattle crew, everybody's used to hiking, we can strip it down and, like, go out to these cool spots. So, uh, case in point, um... This is celebrated actor and filmmaker Jay Duplass lying on a tarp between scenes because we didn't have a trailer. Um, <laughs> but the main, the main trick to, to shooting out in really cool locations is you can't bring a lot of like light equipment. You can't bring in you know, big generators and trucks and apparatus. So we designed the whole thing around natural light. And I thought this was a really safe bet because the whole rainforest is one of the most overcast places on Earth. Um, it's like right next to Forks, Washington, where the Twilight series is set. It's like while the, while, while the vampires are out there. And uh, when uh, the sky is overcast, it diffuses the sunlight. So you can shoot all day, and your light is very, very similar. And so when this shot uh, was, was shot, uh, we had that overcast lighting that I planned for, but this scene was shot over two days, as were many of our scenes. And sure enough, the next morning, it was bright sunshine. And uh, it's weird to be in the Northwest and wake up to sunshine and be, like, terrified. <laughs> um, so, so what we did is we didn't bring lighting equipment, but we brought a bunch of black cloth. So we ended up building, like, a tent out of black cloth around that nest. And uh, if you pay really close attention, the second part of the scene is all really tight. And it really wasn't how I wanted to shoot the scene, but we were trapped inside of a black tent with the actors only able to get these really tight angles. So, you know, we made it work. Um, but the thing was is that wasn't just one day. We had a record amount of sunshine in the whole rainforest. It was sunny like the whole time. So it completely threw all of our planning out the window. And every morning you look at the forecast and you'd be planning a shoot by the hour because you have to like sync up with the sun's movement. So we can shoot from like 8 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. over here. Then we take a break and then go over here. And it turned into this just crazy like micromanaged production. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, whole orlac harvesting process, um, which uh, you know it, it 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 sort of functions in the story as kind of an analog to the gold rush, but because this is a sci-fi film, we wanted to get a little weirder with it, um, and kind of gravitated toward this idea that these, uh, much like oysters, these gems form uh, like they crystallize inside uh, this like rhizomatic colony of organisms that live beneath the. Uh, the surface of the forest. And um, essentially, um, as opposed to kind of a more, I suppose, sterile, inert, uh, like mining or mineral process, we wanted it to feel organic, we wanted it to feel alive and kind of caustic. 
Um, and then we also knew we wanted it to be executed very practically. Um, this is a theme throughout the entire execution of the film. This goes back to the movies that we grew up on as kids that inspired us, Star Wars, Blade Runner, um, you know, the, the alien uh, uh, films. And, and we wanted to imbue our film with uh, that real tangible kind of texture. Um, so to make the Orlac Nest, we partnered with these guys out in West Seattle who run a company called Vandersnatch and uh, developed this whole process. And the cool thing about it was what they built was essentially a seamless process from start to finish. So they would set up a nest in this hole in the middle of the forest. And then we could start rolling the camera and then Jada Plus um, could go through every single stage of the process continuously in a single take. Um, this was something that we wanted to kind of bring to the character of the film, was to not shy away from the minutia of this kind of blue collar life out um, in the wilderness and really embrace kind of like the technicalities of the process. So we wanted to be able to shoot every single step of this convoluted thing. Um, it, also uh, it also created a unique challenge uh, for the, the actors. Um, Jay said that uh, this is the most difficult film he's ever worked on solely because of all of these really technical, fictional things he had to memorize. He also had a big scene where he lands a spacecraft uh, and there's all these like switches and buttons and he had to memorize all these sequences to it. But um, that offered a, a, a unique challenge in, in, in sort of training made up uh, technical processes. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I think another, probably the most pervasive challenge that affected everyone from the cast to the crew across the board was our borderline ridiculous and, and perhaps foolhardy commitment to uh, helmets. Um, <laughs> if you watch a lot of science fiction films, you'll notice that the filmmakers often come up with uh, creative uh, ways to get their characters out of their helmets. Um, this was something that, uh, as young up-and-coming filmmakers with a lot of big ideas about what science fiction was, wanted to buck. Um, and uh, we, we pay for it throughout the entire course of the production. Um, but at the same time, it was all in the effort to lend the film the integrity. This is a, a big element of the story is that uh, you know, they're constantly under the threat of this toxic environment. And were we to come up with ways to alleviate that, it sort of eliminates a lot of the tension. So I think if there is a record, I don't know if, uh, if it's ever been calculated for like most lines of dialogue inside enclosed space helmets. I feel like we have a good shot at it. It's about 60 or 70 percent of the film takes place inside the helmets. Um, and practically, you know, this for, for the actors, this was, you know, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's claustrophobic. You have this enclosed space, your voice is bouncing around, it's difficult to breathe. Um, and the visors are fogging up, which obviously creates not only continuity issues, it's just uh, unappealing on camera. Um, and we were constantly evolving our, our means of, of kind of fighting the, the, the difficulties of these helmets. Um, essentially by the end of the shoot, when we were having scenes with um, not just two, but like seven to eight people in helmets, um, we, we developed a system of, of, of what functioned like pit crews for each actor. So on cut, there'd be a team of like five people that would rush each actor, pop off the visor, clean it off, apply an anti-fog coating, fix all of the stuff that you know was was attached to their bodies, all these fake pieces of plastic and, and props for their spacesuits that would break on every take. Um, and it was something that was like a constant adjustment for the crew, for the actors, and then for us because uh, um, you know we had to adjust the way that we managed our time because every time you yelled cut, it would be probably minimum 10 minutes before you could reset and get back again just because of all of this practical And uh, the problems didn't end there. So if you look really closely, and this is a kind of a lower resolution projector, but there's kind of a black shape right there. Uh, that's the camera person. Uh, so these visors reflect everything in the environment. So in this case, uh, the, the camera person was pretty close, so we just wrapped them in a black cloak so that if you kind of ambiently notice that, it just maybe appears like something else in the forest. Um, but the other thing we had to do is, is train the entire crew that when you yelled rolling, that the camera was rolling, uh, everyone hides. So it's just like they disappear like into the ferns. And then you yell, and then you yell cut, and they rose like, like an army of zombies 
out. So we like had to essentially train everybody to be invisible. Um, but it was also kind of cool because then for the actors, it's like you know extremely immersive. They can look around their entire environment, and it's it's just this this alien moon. And so uh, I think the last kind of key thing we want to talk about is um, the, the production design of the movie. So uh, this is actually probably one of the lighter scenes in terms of production design. By production design, I mean the sets, the props, uh, everything that we had to physically make. Uh, in this scene, we just have a couple of actors in the woods, but there's other scenes with entire spaceships and, and uh, ensembles of people. Um, but everything you see here, I think except for their shoes, uh, are, are made from scratch. So these are original designs uh, that, were, that were tailored. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of gear involved and everything was, was designed because we wanted this world to be uh, completely uh, immersive and um, to, to like, we love movies where you can watch them again and again and notice new details. Um, and the way we were able to do this is we opened our own production design shop uh, in Fremont. Um, we got a big uh, warehouse uh, behind uh, the Episcopal bookstore and a pot shop. And uh, we got to spend seven months building this uh, original world. Uh, and this was the most like, fun and exhilarating thing um, I've ever gotten to do. I've got a picture. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> so yeah, it was this old uh, boat building warehouse. So it had these really high ceilings and kind of these decks that we, we just sort of filled with all the different departments. Um, you know, like a wood shop and a metal shop and a plastic shop and a paint booth and everything kind of all in one. Um, and we got to f gather together this really kind of unusual group of people. Because in Seattle, again, there's no kind of traditional film industry. There's not people who have a lot of experience specifically building props and sets. But we do have a lot of people that just make stuff. So, uh, for example, uh, the guy who designed the control consoles for the spaceships uh, came from Boeing, um, which was a pretty relevant experience. Uh, the, uh, the guy who, who designed the, the you know, like the sci-fi guns uh, came from the actual firearms industry. He kind of wanted to get out and make fake guns instead of real ones. Um, and uh, the person who designed uh, one of the space pods came from building like really cool custom bicycles and just sort of convinced us he could do it. And so we had uh, industrial designers and graphic designers and like, you know, all, all the different facets that the creative community has here that kind of came together and, and got to make this fictional world. And uh, what was really cool was that when, when you hire this kind of stuff out in a Hollywood prop shop, they ask you a lot of questions like, uh, is this going to be in a close-up? Is this going to be in the background? Is this going to be out of focus? And you know, if, if you're not going to really see like part of a set, for example, in extreme detail, they won't bother painting it. Um, where this group didn't know about any of that. And they made everything to like full like quality detail, um, which uh, is is like again gets at that level of like uh, immersiveness. So you know, in some random shot, a character will like turn around for two split seconds, you'll see that their suit has like a fabric tag, and like all these things that like Hollywood studios wouldn't uh, bother doing. And uh, so clearly, with this film, we tried uh, a whole lot of experiments. And uh, we, we definitely learned from them, and uh, there's definitely, like the helmets, we probably won't do again. But I think one of the kind of areas where we actually, I think, broke into actual innovation was this production design shop. And we're incredibly excited to kind of keep with that mentality. Chris and I don't want to go and do now a big Hollywood movie with the traditional system. We want to try to keep kind of relatively smaller projects and uh, retain this level of autonomy. So we uh, have kind of kept the key members of that crew together and we formed uh, this group we're calling the Taka Collective. And uh, we actually, we did a gallery showing um, this last December at Glassbox and made just kind of a whole bunch of stuff to kind of showcase different abilities. So in the bottom right corner here, this is a sort of a mashup between a, a Zen garden and a pinball table. We're calling the Flow State Machine. It kind of is like this mindfulness exercise. This chair in the middle is actually a speaker that you can sort of sit inside and have this kind of very immersive audio experience. 
on the left there, that's a half man, half Puget Sound king crab. And I could, I could give a whole presentation just on him. He has a very elaborate backstory. But we're, we're, we're trying to get this collective together so that between these bigger projects, uh, like you know, film and film and television, uh, we can kind of you know offer this group services to Seattle, doing kind of installations and you know the work that's available here, which definitely isn't necessarily film industry uh, focused. But um, I think kind of the the happy ending to our story is that we're now developing a series with Amazon uh, specifically around this mentality. They really liked Prospect and liked this shop and this kind of crazy way of making a movie. So hopefully uh, that continues to go well and uh, we, get to, we get to make that. Are we on time? Oh, we're good. Yeah, I mean, I guess I think the only thing I want to add to this is that, um, you know, the, the objective from square one of this film was chasing after that feeling of immersion, creating an, an original world. We wanted to do everything we can to, to create a platform for people to get lost in it. And I think one of the, the pivotal things that was, that emerged out of kind of this unique production philosophy, this unique methodology, which was largely dictated by necessity. The reason we built the shop was because we had to, because of our resources and where we were. Um, but what it yielded was this really cool place where the entire pre-production of the film took place under one roof. So where everything was being built, where everything was being designed, Zeke and I were coming in every day, we had our producers coming in every day, we were, we were planning out logistics, we were doing casting, and it made the entire process very interconnected. And, um, you know, in, in kind of the pursuit of that immersion, one of the things as a storyteller that we wanted to do was to uh, make everything as self-evident as possible. To, um, you know, science fiction films in particular are um, obligated to parse out a lot of exposition because there's so much specific, unique things to each story. And we wanted to take as much of that part of the storytelling out of the character's mouths as possible and make it self-evident in the accoutrement of the scene. And one of the ways that we were able to do that was because we were all operating under this one roof. Zeke and I could see where one of the designers was taking a certain prop and we could brainstorm about the ideas of how that could be most effectively self-evident on screen so that then we could go back to the script, which, which you know was sitting on my computer in the next room, and make some adjustments to kind of clean up the dialogue to compensate. And it was this kind of fusion and in interconnected design and narrative creative process. And, and with Taka and a lot of the stuff we're doing in the future, it's something we want to continue to hone and develop. Um, yeah. yeah, and um, if you're into watching movies about alien oysters being pulled out of the ground and are in, actually intrigued, uh, we, uh, it's already had its theatrical run, that was past November, but it'll be available for rental like on Amazon and iTunes uh, this coming March. Yeah. Thanks so much for having Thank us. You. Could you, could you talk a little bit about the, the sort of evolution of going from, hey, I've got an idea for a movie, to we made a movie? Like, it seems like it takes a fair amount of conviction in the idea if, and, and resourcefulness, right? So um, for those of us who aspire one day to be able to, to sort of make that hurdle, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that process. Yeah, um, we actually fairly recently gave a one-hour presentation about that process, so to, to condense. Um, I mean, I think it's, it, we took a, a not uncommon route in that we made short films. So we made uh, a, a, our first short film together in 2011 and took that to festivals and learned a lot from that. We actually tried to adapt that short film in a feature uh, and it didn't work out. We, the story didn't come together. So then when we made another short film, our next short film, we kind of had uh, the idea in mind that this would turn into something bigger. And that short film was also called Prospect and was the basis for this, for this feature film. So, um, I mean, for us, uh, I mean, very specifically, we're doing kind of uh, science fiction world building. So, you know, we, we sort of built this, this kind of world and then uh, populated it with characters. Um, but the, develop of the mov development of the movie took over uh, three years. Um, we went through about four or five different financiers uh, where it fell through. But every time uh, a financing deal fell through, we kind of went back to the script. And over the course of that three years, I'd say, we rewrote the script uh, three or four times. And I think I'm so glad it took 
so long to get financed because the script really needed that uh, development time, uh, even though it was pretty kind of stressful. Yeah, I'll just add that um, it was an interesting uh, experience, uh, unexpectedly emotional one, uh, going through this whole seeking financing phase and, and pitching in Hollywood and trying to convince people uh, to give you money to do something that you've never done before. Um, and, uh, you know, we felt at, at many times that, you know, it, it was the Wild West and in terms of like, you know, how we presented uh, our material to a prospective financier, it was a constantly evolving process. I think that for us, having the short film as the proof of concept was, was pretty instrumental because it wasn't just words on a page. We could showcase tone and aesthetic because there was a lot of very specific things we were wanting to do there. And over the course of multiple financing deals falling through or not coming together, um, we just kept bolstering that pitch. And so we were working with a lot of our early collaborators in production design, um, our production designer, Matt Acosta, and a lot of the, the um, set uh, and prop design leads to generate designs to start pumping out concept art. Um, if, if anyone's seen the documentary Yodorovsky's Dune, um, which is a documentary about Yodorovsky's process for um, just developing kind of the, uh, the idea of a Dune feature. Um, he, we were very much inspired by the like big hardcover book of designs that they have in there, and so we essentially created our own, so that when we would go into pitch meetings, we'd have this big printed book that we could slam down on the table and they could immediately start looking at that. And um, in a lot of ways, we kind of like got a jump start by virtue of doing this on the pre-production of the film, because when we started production, we had already gone through a lot of design processes and uh, had a lot of art to reference. And the only thing I gotta throw out is uh, the unusual part about pitching this film is that we were pitching opening this production design shop from the front end, and which is a very unusual thing to do. Um, and essentially required also handing in a business plan along with everything else. So actually, uh, we have our producer here, Bryce, who made just numerous Excel sheets. There's a lot of spreadsheets involved. And by the end of that three years, he had budgeted out like every screwdriver. So we could like pass this over and be like, hey, we know what we're doing. This is, this is going to work. No, I, I well, when, well, when we first uh, started pitching the film, we actually were presenting it as a $2 million movie, and we quickly learned by working with Bryce that that was impossible. So it did, the budget did sort of creep up, but we still kept it, kept it fairly low. And yeah, I don't, I don't feel like we compromised. I mean, I think we were very much coming from a space where we knew that we were, like, the budget that we actually acquired by the end of this is actually kind of high for the typical, like, first feature filmmaker. Um, and I think that was a factor of all of the kind of groundwork that, that we were doing in the plan that we presented. But we were coming at this from a perspective of how can we be as resourceful as possible? How can we make as big, how can we make this world feel as big as possible within the constraints of limited resources? So even things like from the beginning, you know, the entire film is locked into the perspective of this teenage girl and we only ever see things that she sees. And in some ways, you know, that perspective was, was um, in part, you know, to be, to work in harmony with limited resources. Sources. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is this is you know like like we described a lot of the production design effort and kind of the pursuit of immersion, um, the feeling of being dropped into this completely alien world and 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 being an observer of it. Um, that's you know that's that's the feeling we're chasing. That's what we love about science fiction films as kids, um, and that's what we were trying to channel. And the and the language, the style of the dialogue became one of uh, one of one of the means to kind of establish that world and that tone. Um, obviously, a lot. Uh, when, if and when you see the film, uh, there's, there's a very apparent Western feel to a lot of it. Um, we were very much drawing from that kind of frontier vibe. And um, this character um, that she's referencing, Ezra, uh, in particular has a very unique way of speaking that's kind of laden with a lot of kind of courtly argo and, and turns of phrase uh, that you would kind of, that, that feel typical to a Western, that kind of classic, overly loquacious Western archetype, but um, you know, with an entirely fictionalized kind of palette of vernacular. So there was a lot of kind of, I don't know, uh, the writing process involved a lot of kind of phonetic beat poetry in terms of like trying to figure out the words that were, you know, they're fictional words, but they have to like sound right and evoke the right feelings so that from the context you can pick it apart. But um, it's something that I personally love is that kind of, you know, language that is thick with 
you know, all these levels of like texture and references and uh, to be able to kind of like experience it texturally. Um, you know, the, the goal was for it to contribute to the, the feeling of the world. Yeah, um, so I, we didn't really talk about it much, but I do have a slide. We do have a commercial production company, uh, Shep Films, which is really where we, that was our film school. You know, we'd, we'd get a, a budget from, from a company like Mastin Labs and then see what we could do with it. Um, and yeah, I'd say to make this film, we, we did kind of walk away from that uh, commercial uh, production company. But as, since we've completed it, we found that like uh, making the type of films we wanna make, which uh, we wanna write them ourselves, we wanna develop these really detailed independent worlds, it takes a lot of development time. And I think as independent filmmakers, it's gonna be important for us to like keep this commercial business running in between these gaps. So uh, we were gone, but now we're back, <laughs> is the short answer. Um, I will say that uh, when we started this company in 2011, it was just the two of us, um, Zeke and I, kind of doing every element of the process, and, and we grew over time, and kind of the philosophy from the beginning was to have kind of a... Uh, uh, co uh, I guess an interconnected relationship between commercial and narrative work. We had our narrative aspirations. We also had the commercial company that we were developing. And in a lot of ways, it's like everything we learned from one, we could apply to the other. Um, and then Shep Films, um, you know, essentially we went dark on commercials for a about a year to make Prospect because our production team for the commercial company became the production team for the feature film. So we had a really tight knit camera crew and then, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's turned into kind of a collective of, of people who are all working toward, um, uh, 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 you know, the craft of, of, of filmmaking and um, we're all kind of like growing up together and, and uh, you know, coming through, through this all. And so um, we want to, we definitely want to continue to operate in that kind of interconnected fusion of, of commercial and narrative work informing each other and, and to see, you know, where that takes us. Yeah, for sure. It, it's so funny. So we, we take our short films to film festivals and what you find is that there's a lot of European filmmakers at these things because in other countries, there's public financing, which is like blew my mind. You just submit an application to the government and they give you like 50 grand to go make a short film. So uh, we don't have that here. Um, and so very much like, yeah, Shep was kind of uh, like, yeah, our development arm. It's like we could go make a bunch of commer commercials for Microsoft and then use, uh, I mean, that crew, you know, our, the gear from our company and the money we were making to then go and, and fund our own short films. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it's all silicone and uh, foam. And, uh, and uh, actually, this stuff that is, um, this is kind of gross, it's lubricant for uh, livestock artificial insemination. That's the key. Uh, no, <laughs> no not, not at this time. You're not the first person to ask. Um, but if actually uh, we were, as the movie's been released, we're, we're putting more of that stuff out on our Taka Collective kind of Instagram. Because, um, yeah, it's a lot of cool art that, that we want to get out there. Cool. Thank you so much.